Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever this finds you. Welcome to the very first Emerging Growth Space Symposium. We are exploring the future of space and satellite. I'm Anna Berry, and I'll be your host today. So just a few notes. During each company's presentation today, you can submit questions through our webcast module, and we will attempt to address as many of these as possible at the end of the presentation. Now, all of our conferences are uploaded to the Emerging Growth Conference YouTube channel. So subscribe there at youtube.com slash emerging growth conference. Today we'll be running until 5.30 p.m. Eastern time. Now, when we switch to the next company, you're going to see a black screen for a moment. Don't go anywhere. It's just us moving over. But if you do experience downtime, refresh your browser and everything should work properly again. Our platform does work best on Google Chrome. So if you're watching from an Apple device, you have to hit the play button to start the session. And one last note, after today's event, you'll be redirected to the registration page for our next conference. So stay on or come back to reserve your spot early. Let's begin. Starting with Spire Global Inc., it trades on the New York Stock Exchange under the symbol SPIR and is a global provider of space-based data, analytics, and space services, offering unique data sets and powerful insights about Earth so that organizations can make decisions with confidence in a rapidly changing world. Spire builds, owns, and operates a fully deployed satellite constellation that observes the Earth in real time using radio frequency technology. The data acquired by Spire satellites provides global weather intelligence ship and plane movements, and spoofing and jamming detection to better predict how the patterns impact economies, global security, business operations, and the environment. Today, we'll be speaking with the CEO, Peter Platzer. Peter is one of Spire's co-founders and the CEO. But prior to founding Spire, Peter worked on Wall Street as a senior portfolio manager and head of quantitative research. Peter has degrees in physics and space science and management. Additionally, he earned his MBA from Harvard Business School. It's an honor to present Peter Platzer today. Welcome, Peter. It's a pleasure to be here, Anna, and open up this fantastic conference. It's a really, really impressive lineup that you have here. I think it's going to be a fascinating day. Yes, it is. All right, take it away and call me back when you're ready for questions. Absolutely. So Spire, indeed, as Anna has, has shared, is a space-based data and analytics company. It's really a SaaS company that is leveraging space to create an improved and better life here on Earth. We really focused on the future of planet Earth. Um, as a public company, we have the great pleasure of sharing with you long disclaimers, and particularly about potentially forward-looking statements which might or might not happen during the presentation, something that all of you are well aware of. Now, when people hear space, they often think, oh, there are so many satellites and they all do the same things. Um, unfortunately, um, we don't have a nomenclature like, for example, the transportation industry. In the transportation industry, you know, you talk about planes and ships and trains, and everyone understands how they're different, even though all of them have engines and wheels and passengers and cargoes and, and windows, uh, but they are, by their name, very obviously different. Now, to help with that in the space industry, because unfortunately, until today, we still call everything a satellite, um, we, have, we have this framework for you. Um, there are three types of satellites. We call them looking, talking, and listening satellites. Looking satellites, they have cameras that capture the reflection of the sunlight on the surface of Earth, generally mostly land, um, and then uh, calculate the data from, uh, from, 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 that, from those reflections. So it works particularly well during the day it works particularly well um, doing a good weather. And there are companies that you might have heard of, you know, like a Maxar, a Black Sky, a Planet, uh, and a Satellogic, an Airbus. Those are all um, looking satellites that capture, you know, interesting data from uh, cameras. And then there are talking satellites. Now, talking satellites are best thought of as data transportation devices. 
they pick up data on one spot on Earth and then via space transport it to another location on Earth. Um, you can think of them like a, like a Viasat or you an, an AST or a, a, um, a Kuipus or a OneWeb or a Starlink. Those are all um, uh, uh, talking satellites that transport sometimes larger, sometimes smaller amount of data from one spot to another spot on Earth. Sometimes, you know, they're called also communication satellites. And then you have listening satellites. Now, listening satellites use RF uh, or radio frequency waves and RF radio frequency technologies to observe what is happening on or around Earth. Now, um, radio frequency waves have the advantage that they don't require the sun, so they work during day and during night, and they are weather independent. As a matter of fact, some of those radio waves can actually tell you things like the speed inside um, a hurricane or the rain that is happening somewhere, so they can actually give you information about the weather. In that category, you have companies like a Geo Optics, like a Hawkeye, um, and Spire is also a member of the listening category. Spire happens to be the largest of that category by customers' revenue deployed constellation um, using a fully deployed constellation of satellites to listen to what is happening on or around Earth. And I thought I'd give you a short little preview, a video about how this uh, listening works and the incredible insights that you can gather from there. What does the world look like beyond visible light? What might we see if we could expand our vision? First, ultraviolet and infrared. Then, X-rays, and gamma rays, and radio. Well, okay, if we could expand our vision, the data we would see is beyond the human ability to process it. The electromagnetic spectrum has two radiation types that make a significant impact on our daily lives. Visible color and radio. The color spectrum is obvious, it is data visible within our human ability. But as technology advances, it's the radio spectrum that captures our imagination. Amazing devices collecting superhuman data, processing it, transmitting it, and utilizing it in more and more influential ways. Much of it focusing on human-generated efforts for human-generated purposes. But we didn't get this far by human ability alone. We can exceed the farthest reaches of our solar system. We can dive as deep and fly as high and live in the vacuum of space. By looking beyond human ability, we dream dreams, we realize visions, and strive for something greater than ourselves. So as we enter this amazing age of connected knowledge, this age of super data, why would our efforts be focused only on us? What kind of data is out there that is greater than ourselves? for purposes greater than our own. The same way we look beyond our human ability, Spire sources Earth data that lies beyond the color spectrum, valuable, hard to acquire data that affects not only human efforts, not just human purposes, but our majestic world around us. We can use this invisible data, this spectrum beyond human ability, to reach out and pull ourselves up by our visions, buy our dreams, and take that next great leap. A leap that, at first, is a leap of faith. Then solidifies. And becomes history. So now you have a bit of a sense of how listening really captures a large amount of highly valuable and interesting information. Now, Spire in particular has a fully deployed constellation with about 100 satellites on orbit. These satellites 
track um, a, a, a whole activity all across the oceans. Every single ship and their information, their location, their speed, the type of cargo is tracked by that constellation. Um, and the constellation captures all of that information on every spot on Earth at least every 15 minutes, over 100 times a day. It's a thing for planes, tracking where they are, where they're coming, where they're going, their names, their height, their speed, their location. Um, again, all across the world, scouring the globe on an ongoing basis every 15 minutes. And it also captures weather information, rain, precipitation, temperature, moisture, pressure, soil moisture, wind speed. Those are all variables that that constellation captures all across the planet a hundred times at least a day. And it's all technology that Spire has invented as well as built as well as operates. How do we operate that infrastructure? We have one of the world's largest ground station networks as well. So over 70 antennas um, that are distributed across 16 countries, 30 plus locations, capture that information An incredibly low latency of getting that information from space and delivering it back to our customers. Talking about customers, we have almost 800 customers that subscribe to our services across the world with a guided uh, uh, ARR, which is annually recurring revenue or subscription revenue of over 130 million for this year. We have accumulated, thanks to the incredible work that our over 400 uh, mid, uh, uh, staff members from uh, eight locations have done over the last, you know, it's now almost 12 years, um, over 500 years of experience of our technology, our sensors in space. And the unique and powerful thing of that is you cannot simulate space on Earth. You have to go there and you have to try it and you have to learn and iterate. Now, I mentioned the capabilities on the maritime side, and unfortunately, there is an increasing number of people that try to do quite nefarious things on the oceans. You might have seen a recent article in the New York Times that was really incredibly powerful in telling that story of nefarious activities, leveraging spires data. But let me tell you a little bit more again in a short video. The Symphony Freedom is a Panama flagged oil tanker owned and operated by Shining Sea Dev Limited. On July 15, 2022, according to received positional data from the onboard AIS system, the ship passed the coast of South Africa and started on a northern journey. However, this ship is hiding a secret. The positional data being sent is manipulated and the ship is heading on a completely different route. Spire is first to market with a near-time service dedicated to exposing these secrets, allowing maritime domain professionals to uncover a ship's true location. In the case of the Symphony Freedom, it is heading on a northwest course and expected to break sanctions by visiting an oil terminal in Venezuela. Our data indicates this type of activity has happened with over 250 vessels in the past seven days. That equates hundreds of millions of dollars in illicit oil transactions. Learn more about our advanced maritime domain awareness offerings. Bringing more of that transparency to the world um, is one of the, the core tenants of how Spire operates. Um, it is uh, one of the two big drivers of what we believe is uh, demand for our products, global security and global climate change. And we have just talked about the maritime market, where, of course, there is a large economy behind it. Um, $20 trillion of global trade, over 90% happens on the oceans. You have maritime insurance, you have harbors that are the, the, the vessels of commerce for countries for import and export. And then you have the aviation economy. Again, another very 
large market. Um, Four trillion dollars of a size, as some people estimate, the aviation market. Um, whether you know, we talked about a third of the global economy, thirty trillion dollars are impacted by the weather. CEOs across the world are increasingly talking about weather impact on their operations, looking for solutions that help them tackle the uncertainty, reduce the risk, reduce the cost, but also reduce their carbon footprint. And then space services, where people can rent our infrastructure and launch a business in space just as easily as they can launch an e-commerce business on Amazon AWS. The proof is in the pudding, you say, and I think indeed it is. By the time Spire had its fully deployed constellation that was allowing us to provide a service, we had our first million dollar of subscription revenue. And we were then able, in a span of just five years, to grow that to a hundred million dollars of subscription revenue. Over that period since we had that constellation, our compound annual growth rate has been 109%. And that really demonstrates the dramatic pent up demand for the type of data that Spire uh, collects, the type of product, the type of services that we offer our customers to lower their operational cost, to improve their risk profile, to smooth what they can do, to improve the reach that they can do uh, across the world, to increase the offering that they can do for their customers. And it is really one of the core tenets of Spire, a um, uh, business model, that how we created it. We said we are a data company that requires a full constellation to capture the data, which means you cannot really uh, create a competitive threat to us with just a single satellite. And then we said um, uh, our data cannot compete or cannot be generated by anything on uh, terrestrial means, which means our data is unique and only available from space. And thirdly, uh, our constellation is software defined. Um, I write software since I'm a little teenager. Um, and so that concept of constant iteration, being able to improve things on an ongoing basis was really, really important in our business model and allows us to pivot based on our customer demands to uh, different types of data, different qualities of data, different amounts of data, different um, structures, just by software upgrades to the assets that we have already deployed on orbit. And it is that, that software defined nature that also allows us to continually delight both new, but also existing customers. How do we know that? Well, they keep on buying more from us as we help them solve additional use cases for them. In the world of, uh, of SaaS businesses, just like ourselves, it is called the net retention rate which is a measure of customers, how much often do they renew with you after the end of their annual or biannual contract? And then how much more do they buy from you? Which in our case yeah, is a rate at the end of last year of 117% net retention rate, showcasing the incredible value that we can bring to our customers. Now I want to talk about um, uh, uh, that the weather, something that is very, very dear to our heart um, and climate change and something that I consider one of the greatest challenges that we all face together in adapting to um, the ever increasing prevalence of wildfires. Um, some of you that might be in the US have heard that today, New York City is one of the single most polluted, air polluted places on, on, on earth because of wildfires polluting the air. And I want, to, I want to share with you a little bit about that capability because it is, it is really, really crucial and very, very core to our mission, wanting to help humanity adapt to climate change. We hear you, Earth. Spire is the space company focused on the future of planet Earth. And what is more important to the future of our planet than our climate? The weather affects every person, 
every business, everywhere, every second of the day. Our constellation of over a hundred and growing satellites hears all aspects of weather. Spire Weather leverages the power of a technique called radio occultation to gather thousands of atmospheric measurements 24/7, measuring temperature, humidity, and pressure in the atmosphere anytime, anywhere on the globe, even far remote locations. Spire Weather Technology provides historical weather data from the past 30 years for any point on the globe, current global weather conditions from every location on the planet, advanced weather forecasts for anywhere in the world, from the most remote regions to the open oceans, and hyper-local weather forecasts just for your specific location. That allows people and organizations to quantify the risks of, prepare for, and mitigate extreme weather events. Spire Weather is a powerful catalyst for business seeking innovative weather insights to optimize costs, increase safety, and build sustainable operations. All that can give your business a very powerful competitive advantage. Spire is the trusted weather partner for a changing world. A world we hear because we have to, to help build a more sustainable, equitable, and prosperous future for all humans. Let's keep on talking about the business model of Spire. Our fully deployed constellation captures the data once and then can sell it an almost unlimited amount of time with every additional customer only having a very small marginal cost, just as you would expect from a data uh, uh, as a subscription and a software as a subscription service. So when we capture the data from our fully deployed constellation, fully deployed here means that you're not going to continue spending large amounts of money to increase that constellation. Um, it is indeed fully deployed at this point in time. So we capture this data, we clean it, we structure it, we make it available to our customers as a subscription in like that first level, which we call clean data. We then enrich it with analytics, as well as with our third party data set, fusing them together, creating a smarter and more valuable product for our customers that they can upgrade their subscription to and um, get from us through a simple API. And then we take all of that historical data that is growing by the hundreds of millions of data points every single day, data that is only available from a constellation from space, and use it to train our AI and machine learning and advanced analytics models and create uh, predictions about what is most likely to happen. And again, make that available as a subscription to our customers. And then in the last stage, we augment that with you know, visualization and decision-making tools to help our customers make choices of what they should be doing given all of that that is happening. Now, I mentioned numerous times space in our constellation, and as such, we don't care just about the environment on Earth, as I had mentioned earlier, but we do care about the environment in space as well. And space debris is an area that has been getting a lot of attention, very rightfully so. It is a, another market that is uh, set to grow tremendously. And I'm, I'm excited to show you a particular mission that we're doing with a partner that goes to the very heart of the problem of space situation awareness and space debris. We're so excited about Adler 2. This mission is the second collaboration between Spire and Austrian Space Forum. Adler 1 was the first of its kind mission, wherein it analyzed space debris on orbit with a 3U satellite. This kind of insight analysis had never been carried out before Adler 1. Adler 2 is now taking this mission to the next level with a 6U satellite, more capacity for data gathering, and therefore more insights. With Adler 2, Austrian Space Forum is looking to enhance orbital debris monitoring in low Earth orbit. 
Adler 2 is a multi-payload satellite that uses Spire's Lemur 6U platform and will carry three customer payloads, AIPD, gap map, and larger antennas and radar. Adler 2 is expected to help increase the debris detection rate thanks to the use of a debris detection radar with a larger antenna and increased detection range, and also to double the number of observations logged. Space debris and their detection is indeed a challenging issue. We look forward to continuously supporting Adler missions through our space as a service business model. With Spire Space Services, we're here to simplify space for all, whether you bring your own payload, develop a custom payload with Spire, or upload your code to one of our existing satellites. We provide you the infrastructure to do this faster and with minimum risk. When you think space, think Spire. So really very, very excited about, about this mission. Now let's briefly talk about um, the macroeconomic environment and our recent Q1 results. I think I'm probably not telling you anything new that the macroeconomic environment is indeed, um, uh, uh, as the Scottish would say, a wee bit challenging um, as we hear about banking concerns and banks going um, uh, out of business. There's you know, increasing interest rates you know, um, uh, in the first year uh, many companies have, especially in the technology sector, tremendously reduced their workforce. Fire has not. We're always looking for great people to help serve our customers. Um, but it is certainly an environment where recession is a fear um, and a reality in, in many instances that we all have to contend with. Against that backdrop, um, I'm, I'm very excited to share that our first quarter was a, a resounding success um, it was our uh, seventh quarter as a public company where we have reported, um, again, growing our revenue. We exceeded um, uh, most, if not all, of our metrics that we have given guidance on. And particularly, we're very proud on our metric with regards to profitability, where we have, again, shown the immense amount of operational leverage and profitability of our business model, given the uniqueness of our data and solutions. Talking about the uniqueness of our data and solutions, um, this is one of our customers that um, asked the, the very, very insightful question. What if the shortest route over the ocean is not the most efficient? And what could that do to not just the bottom line of customers, but also to the global footprint? Let's take a look. Really incredibly excited about supporting uh, Blue Pulse, our customer. And when I hear and see those metrics, tens of millions of dollars saved, tens of thousands of tons of carbon dioxide um, uh, saved and not polluting the atmosphere, it is those things that get me really, really excited and proud to be part of our team across the world that is, is working every day to, to make a difference. And I think we can be very proud of the underlying business structure that we have built that allows us to keep on margin at a very, very fast pace to profitability at a um, still pretty small scale, 100, 130 million of annually recurring revenue is by no means what I would call a large company at this point in time. 
it is certainly a company with large potential and reaching that potential profitably is exactly the path that we are on, that we have continued to tick down, that we will continue to operate. And you see here um, at the chart, the steep incline of our profitability metrics. With that, I want to leave you with one last story um, about, about our customers and the impact that we might be having to share with you what gets us every single day out of bed and help our customers create a more sustainable, prosperous, and equitable future. impressive work that Aurora Tech is doing here. Um, uh, and we are so proud to be a technology partner for them, helping them make a difference um, on planet Earth with something that, especially if you are in the New York area today, you can literally smell with your nose right now. And with that, Anna, uh, I would be wonderful and excited to have a conversation about some questions that you might have received. Great presentation, fascinating, fascinating technology, Peter. Yeah, let's start off with a few logistical questions like how big are the satellites in your constellation? How often do you replace them? And do you build them in-house or purchase them? So our satellites are quite small, actually. Think of, uh, of a bottle of wine or maybe like two bottles of wine, at most a case of wine is, uh, is the size of our satellites. And it is the same kind of underlying technology improvement that um, today gives me the power of the Cray 2 supercomputer. I worked at CERN in the power of my hand now, in the palm of my hand with an iPhone. So those are the miniaturization that drive the incredible uh, improvements. Um, we replaced our satellites a little bit similarly to how we replace our iPhones. You know, in theory, they could last a very long time, but sometime after three, four, five years, um, technology improvements through software don't really keep up with the changes in hardware. So that's roughly when we, when we start um, replacing them. And what allows us to keep making them better and more efficient and more powerful all the time is that all of the technology is from Spire. It is in-house. It is built in Glasgow, mostly in our facility, where we have uh, one, of the, one of the world's foremost small satellite manufacturing, designing, engineer, and testing facilities. That's wonderful. That's great to know. Now, you have a, a very unique business model in which you're basically offering a service like a SaaS company, but space as a service. So uh, hash that out for us a little bit. Yeah, so I really all the credit goes here to Amazon, which had to build a massive infrastructure called data centers to drive their e-commerce business. And then they recognize that, hmm, maybe other people want to rent some spare capacity because it's actually quite complex to build data centers and they created this phenomenal product called Amazon AWS that then uh, created a lot of companies quickly being able to take advantage of higher compute power and the internet. Now, um, I, I think I'm not saying something surprising when I say building a constellation space is, is even a little bit more complicated than building a data center. 
But the underlying power from space is also just as great as, uh, as for example, data centers. And so we uh, wanted to open up the massive IP and capabilities and scale that we have to other people that they can just rent from us through a subscription that allows them in a matter of weeks to months and maybe a year um, to have their business operating in space, leveraging our massive scale and operation across the world they don't have to learn anything about quaternions or, or L10s or launches or licensing or any of that. They just get an API to their proprietary specific data that allows them then to service their customers. Space as a service through an API. Space as a service through an API. It's fascinating. So looking through your numbers, Peter, Spire seems to be poised to reach profitability at a top line number that is lower than many assumed it would take to reach profitability. So talk a little bit about what allows a company to be on track to reach profitability, which is so important on the lower than assumed top line numbers. So I think there's two elements to that. One of them is the operational leverage that we have in the business, and I'll talk about that in a second. And the other one is the massive barriers to entry that we have built. Um, on, the, uh, on the operational leverage, it is that we have a fully deployed constellation that is um, at the right size already. We don't have to do any more there. We just do some maintenance and replacements there. And it can support a quasi-unlimited amount of, uh, of data revenue, which means as we bring new customers onto the platform, the marginal cost that we incur is actually a very, very small one. And we do this not in just one solution, as, as some other companies have to, we can do it in four solutions. So it is like this, this diversified offering that we have across maritime, aviation, weather, um, uh, uh, global security, uh, space services, that we allows us to monetize this infrastructure. And then this built-in layers of clean data, then smart data with analytics, then predictive data, you know, mining our data vault all the way to solutions that allows us to monetize all of our infrastructure. Now, that is really supported by the high barriers to entry. Um, the technology that we had to invent was really, really tough not to crack. Um, some people not in, at NASA were, you know, patting me on the shoulder and says, Peter, I think you're going to have to break the laws of physics doing what you tell us you will do. Um, I can promise you we didn't break any laws of physics, but it certainly was a very, very difficult undertaking. And then you have all this software that we have built, all these predictive layers. Then you have the data that we collect data that is only available when you have a massive constellation. Then you have to deploy the constellation, the ground stations, and then you have to get licenses for that. You know, you take all of that together, our best guess is it would take someone four and a half, five years to replicate just the technology side, let alone the customer relationships. So high operational leverage, high barriers to entry, create a very profitable business model. Well, adding on to that profitability, Spire is recently guided to being free cash flow positive in 10 to 16 months. So is that date still holding? And how do you feel about your cash balance and ability to reach that milestone? So that information is already um, uh, about a month old. So we have ticked out. It is now nine months to 15 months that indeed we continue to track down to its free cash flow profitability. So we're not just talking about EBITDA um, uh, profitability, operating margin profitability, but actually producing cash flow from our operations. Um, uh, and yes, indeed it holds. And we feel um, very good about the balance sheet to support that pathway um, to profitability on the free cash flow basis. Um, and we just keep on executing um, uh, alongside those paths. Really, I feel a strong momentum inside the com a company committed to that pathway that we have been on for a year. Everyone is pulling in that direction. And so we're excited when we can uh, announce that we have achieved that milestone in the time frame of nine to 15 months. Wonderful. So switching over to technology for a moment, what are some of the new developments at Spire that really have you excited, Peter? Um, so I will talk about some technologies that I'm allowed to talk about, um, uh, uh, but uh, indeed some of them are, are very, very exciting. 
Um, you might have heard that latency of data, you know, getting information quicker is one of like the big drivers that is happening in the world that generally is digi uh, digitizing, as well as an increasing concern about security. Now, there is a technology that allows you to get data quicker as well as in a more secure fashion. And that is literally lasers in space. I'm never going to get tired of saying that. Um, and the more technical term is called optical intersatellite links. It is literally lasers that collect two satellites and allow you to transport information very securely from one satellite to the next. So that whoever is closest to a ground station can take this information and deliver it to the customer on the ground. But it is not just that. If you go into security a little bit more and you take two or sometimes three of those satellites and link them together with those lasers, for example, it allows them to do computations on orbit, for example, locating a, a ship or someone who is doing spoofing or jamming from a GPS perspective or someone who is sending out a distress signal from those satellites, calculate that position on orbit and immediately send just a small amount of highly actionable information to the ground so that you can immediately act upon that information rather than requiring that information, getting to a ground station, downloaded, combined on the ground process, which can take you know, quite some time. So um, Spire, I believe, has demonstrated um, the smallest form factor optical intersatellite links at this point in time. We have deployed um, a number of those optical intersatellite links, and we are we're quite excited about the benefits that our customers can derive now and in the future from that technology. Lasers in space, much easier to say. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the launch capacity. It seems to be a topic of conversation in this space, pun intended. So is current launch capacity something that keeps you up at night? It is not really something that keeps me up at night. You know, there are um, reliable launch providers available, um, and there is a, a large number of companies that are working on becoming reliable launch providers. Um, it certainly is the case that in the short term, there have been some changes in the launch market, but there is still um, a, a reliable supply of launches available. Um, and given that we don't need to deploy massive constellation sizes, we don't need to deploy massive additional number of satellites, you know, we feel that we have the partnerships in the industry um, and the experience in the industry to serve the needs of our customers with what is available today. And we are excited about the capabilities that are coming up in the future to, um, to help this industry. We have a question from Ken Kennedy um, talking about your satellites for use for third parties. Is that happening for any fee? Do you uh, license them out? That is correct. So um, you can rent capacity on our satellites for a fee through an API, just as the same way you can rent a, a computer from Amazon's data center for a fee to drive your business or your operation. So yes, absolutely, make it very easy for the innovative people all across the world to leverage space to create a more prosperous and sustainable future here on Earth. Rob McCoy says he sees 30% growth in sales from quarters ending March 2022 to 2023. So can we expect this growth rate to continue? So we have given guidance um, uh, for the second quarter, as you mentioned, and we have given guidance for the full year, which is actually a bit higher than the 30% growth rate. And uh, I think we have demonstrated the massive uh, uh, demand in the market with our rapid growth rate. And so I look with great optimism into the future, growing our business, being able to help more customers solve their challenges and deal with some of the great um, opportunities as well as risks that they might face in their business. Evan Gibbs says, great video on the misguided ship. And his question is, is government a subscriber of your service or are you mostly for corporate customers? 
So our business is split roughly 50-50 between um, commercial options as well as government. Um, it was lately a bit more on the comp uh, corporation side, but government is a very reliable and strong customer of ours, um, subscribing to our data and product uh, services. I'm going to try to combine two questions due to time. Leo and Mike Olson, let's talk about your 100 satellites that you have right now. Are you at capacity? Do you need more or can you add additional tasks to existing ones? So that's one of the powerful things of our business model is that we collect the data once and then we can sell it in quite an unlimited amount of time. So we are not capacity constrained. We do not have to um, divvy out time slices and task satellites. We do not have to say, oh, you know, like some uh, some some uh, talking satellites. Oh, you know, my my pipe, my my internet bandwidth is full. I can't handle it anymore. We collect the data once and we can sell it across an unlimited amount of time. In short, we have a constellation size. We love that constellation size. We currently do not see um, any need to increase that for a substantial amount of time with a substantial amount of growth totally supported by the existing constellation size. And Leo asks, what is the cost to put up a satellite? What's their lifespan and what's the maintenance like once they're up? So the good news is, is that people don't have to know anymore, you know, all of those elements because they can just, you know, get an API from Spire that allows them to build their business as we take care of all of those things in the background. Um, the, the, uh, uh, the, the cash flow from Spire's perspective is indeed more front loaded because the, the maintenance of those satellites is a, a pretty low point. And as a company, as a whole, for all of our data businesses, you know, the satellites, the ground stations, the regions, all of that, we spend a pretty fixed amount of the order of 10 to $12 million a year that supports, as I said, a quasi unlimited amount of revenue growth given that fixed infrastructure. And last question due to time. If you could have investors walk away from listening to this conversation, understanding a couple things about your business and its story, what would that be, Peter? I would take away that Spire is a, a SaaS company that is operating at a scale of 100 million ARR that it has reached in five years from its first million of ARR, serving a $100 billion TAM and uh, on a path to profitability in nine to 15 months, that is trading at somewhere between one and one and a half times of ARR. Perfect. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for joining us on our space symposium and we'd love to have you back in the future with some updates. My pleasure. Thanks for being such a wonderful host, Anna. Our pleasure. All right, everyone stay with us. We'll be right back with our next presenter.